Let me ask you something this morning. What is it that matters to you most in your life? What is it, the, 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 the single most important thing in your life? And some, some people start processing this, and they say, uh, my family. My family is the most important thing to me. And then some would say, well, my church. My, my church is, is the most important thing to me. Or some would say my friends, and some would say my career, and some would say possessions. But what if I were to tell you that there's something far more important than any of those things? Right. And somebody say, "Well, I don't know about that. I don't know about that, brother Mike. You're kind of I'm, I'm not I'm not sure what you're where you're going with this." Now, look, I'm not making light of any of those things. Your if your your family should be important to you. Your your wife, your your husband, your children, uh, your your church, right? All those things should be important to you. But there's something far far more important. There's something far more important than all those things by a long shot. Not even close. It's a personal relationship with God through Christ. That's the most important thing. That's got to be the most important thing. Nothing is more important than our relationship with God. You're looking at something that's eternal through things that are temporary, if you want to put it that way. Your, your career, temporary. This, this church, this building, believe it or not, temporary. Relationships with people, temporary, unless they're in Christ. Unless they're in Christ. And, and if they're saved and you're saved, it's not temporary, it's eternal. That's why I like to refer to my faith family, not just as the church of Occupy 2. I refer to you guys as my faith family, my eternal faith family. And that's how I see you. You see, but there's a problem. There's a problem we have that, 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 we, that this idea of, of, of having a relationship with, with God through Christ. Because the Bible clearly declares that each one of us, have broken that relationship with God because of our sin. Right? Every one of us, every one of us have. And so by breaking that relationship, we have become the enemies of God. Enemies of God. And some might be saying that, that that's kind of a strong language, Brother Mike, but that's the, that's the way it is. Our sin has not only separated us from God, it's made us his enemies as well. Right? That's what happened to our first parents when we look all the way back in the book of Genesis with Adam and Eve this, this happened in the very beginning that they walked with God. They were friends with God. They were uh, in the garden with God. They had assignments to do and in, in, uh, close fellowship with God. But all that changed whenever they made the choice to sin. When God said to not eat this, and they said, I think I'll eat this, regardless of what God has said, that is sin. That's disobeying God is sin. It's not, it's not just making a mistake. It's sin. Call, call it what it is, and that's what separates us from God. That's what separated Adam and Eve from God. They became instant enemies of God when they chose to sin. It caused them to be separated from God, and it also brought about death into the world. They were kicked out of the garden, you remember. They removed, were removed from the garden, and, and God placed an angel there so they could not return to the garden anymore. Life changed. It forever changed. They were removed from the garden, but far worse than that, their relationship with God was severed. Their relationship with God was severed. And their exile from Eden placed all future generations at enmity with God as well. Their sin became our sin as well. Their, their propensity or their desire to sin is in our blood. The sin nature that, they, that uh, came about through their choice. Each subsequent human was born with a desire to sin. And we're all sinners according to the Bible by nature and by choice. It's in, our, it's, in our, it's in our genetics almost that we have a desire to sin and we give in to that desire. And of course, according to the Bible, we're all rightly deserving of God's wrath because of that sin. Right? So if we're all sinners, what could we possibly do to have a personal relationship with God? Bad news is we can't do anything ourselves. We can't do anything ourselves but God can, and He has. Amen? He has. Romans 5, 6 through 11 says this. It says, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. And those two great words. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, 
we are reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now receive the reconciliation. Reconciliation. This reconciliation that, the, that Paul speaks of only comes through repentance and faith in Jesus. That's the only way this happens. Jesus made forgiveness possible for you and for me on the cross. Jesus has accomplished everything that was necessary for us to be restored back to a right fellowship with God at Calvary. Now, there's nothing more to be done. Jesus made forgiveness available for our sins, all of our sins. Right? All of them, not, not, just, not just the ones you did in the past, not the ones that you're presently doing, but guess what? Through Christ, the blood has covered even your future sins. Because you know, as well as I do, that even being in Christ does, doesn't make you sinless. We still struggle with sin, but you should sin less. You see the difference? We're not sinless, but we should be sinning less as we sanctify, as we grow in our Christ-likeness, as the Holy Spirit begins to or continues to refine us and shape us. This forgiveness is a gift, though, can only be received by faith. All right, so that's, that's the catch. That's the catch. So as a warning, I would just say there is no salvation, better yet, there is no forgiveness apart from repentance of sin and belief in Jesus' finished work on the cross. It doesn't happen any other way. There is no other way. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles this morning to, to Psalm 32 if you will if you're not already there it, this is kind of an easier one to find pick up your bible if you have a, a, a whole bible some people have just new testaments uh grab your bible and, and and break it open in the middle and it should put you in in the book of psalms and so find your way to psalm 32 is what we're going to look at this morning we're going to we're going to look at a, a psalm that's written by a man that's well acquainted with seeking and receiving the forgiveness of god we're going to look at uh, david We'll just call him David instead of King David. We'll just call him David this morning. And, and he was known as, a, as being a man after God's own heart, right? That's what that's he's known as. That's his title that, or the label that we've known him as. But, but David was also a sinner in need of constant forgiveness. We sometimes forget that, don't we? We, we, we put people on such a pedestal and we forget that, that they're humans. They're humans and fallible humans and they sin as well. And many recall all of uh, great, the greatness of, of David as a leader, his accomplishments. Uh, but he was also a great sinner as well, just like you and me. Right? Just like you and me. That David was in desperate need of forgiveness. You and I are in desperate need of forgiveness as well. The same thing, desperate. So let me pray for us as we get into our passage this morning. Father, I... I thank you for your word. I thank you for the grace you've extended uh, to us. I thank you for forgiveness that is available uh, through the shed blood of Christ, that if we repent and believe, Father, that we can be forgiven, that we can be restored, uh, Father, to you. So this morning, that's, that is my prayer, Father, that salvation would come to this place, that forgiveness would be received this morning in this place. Father, as we study uh, just a, a few verses this morning, God, I, I pray that the 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 power and the, the weight of, of the gospel would be just be heavy in this place this morning, that your presence would be felt in this place, God, that you would be drawing men, women, uh, boys and girls to yourself this morning through this scripture, Father. Thank you so much for loving us. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's, let's take a look at our, at our passage. It's just two verses. Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2. It says, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Right? Powerful, powerful verses. So we have David. David clearly understood that he had offended God and needed forgiveness. Right? He, he, he knew it, and he used three different words to describe those offenses. The, the first one he used was transgression. Right? It was a transgression. And transgression means a, a going away from or a departing or overstepping the limits of God's law. It's basically an act of rebellion against God. That's what, that's what he means when he says that transgression. And then he goes on to say, to use the word that we're familiar with, it's sin. And what sin is, is it's missing the mark. It, it's missing the mark. It's coming short of what God had intended. It's, it's denying his authority. And it's failing according to God's law. And in the third way that he says here in these two verses, 
uh, the, of an, an offense is the word he uses, iniquity. And it, basically, iniquity just means corruption, uh, to be twisted, wicked, immoral, or evil. And so he clearly understood that he needed forgiveness. So he uses three different words to uh, address the same problem. But see, for you and I, uh, or many of us, maybe in this room, or people that we know, we see no need to be forgiven by God, right? We see no need to be forgiven by God because they may have a distorted view of themselves, and, and they may see themselves, uh, they just refuse to see themselves as sinners, right? It's, I'm, not, I'm not a sinner. I may make mistakes, but I'm not a sinner, right? Have you heard something like that? I mean, there's a difference between being a sinner and making mistakes, and me, I just make mistakes. I'm not a, I'm not a sinner. So it's careful as the people of God, we need to use the, the grammar and the terminology that God uses. And so if we just keep telling people that they're just making a mistake and we keep telling people, don't help don't tell people that they're sinners and we don't tell people that they're sinning against God, that's going to cause a problem. That fuels this. That fuels this mindset that people say, I'm a good person. I'm a good person. I may make some mistakes, but I'm not a sinner. I'm not, surely I'm not a sinner. And see, people will do that to themselves. They'll see themselves as being generally good people. And the Bible has a clearly different perception of humanity than most of us. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What does that mean? We're all what? Sinners, right? All sinners. The Bible says that. God says that. And Psalm 14, uh, uh, 1-3 uh, says this. It said, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand who seek God, they have all turned aside, they have together become corrupt, and look at that, there is none who does good, no, not one. So, according to God's word, we're all sinners, and there is no such thing as a good person. Right? Right? We agree? And so this this is the word of God. And so, uh, th- that's why we're all in desperate need of God's forgiveness, every single one of us. So from our psalm this morning, David will tell us why forgiveness is so important. We're going to see two incredible things that happen when God forgives us. The first one that we, we see from this passage is that, when God, uh, that God's forgiveness covers our sin. God's forgiveness covers our sin. And the imagery that I think that David was trying to communicate here, this covering was if you remember whenever uh, Pharaoh was, was uh, chasing after uh, uh, Moses and the Israelites and the, and the Red Sea had, had opened, right, and, and the Israel had passed through. And as soon as they got to the other side and the armies, the, uh, Pharaoh's armies were chasing behind and were in the depths and uh, coming across on dry land. And, and all of a sudden, uh, God closed in the oceans. The, 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 the Red Sea collapsed on them and swept them away and completely covered them and, and were, were gone. They were no more. And so that's the imagery I believe that David is trying to communicate here is that when God covers our sin, it completely covers it. It's gone. It's gone. It doesn't exist anymore. He's done away with it. Our sin is crushed by God's grace and his mercy. And when God forgives, he truly forgives. He forgives and he forgets. Hebrews 8.12 says, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Wow, let that sink in for a minute. That God has made it a choice to remember our sins no more once he forgives us. And in Psalm 103, 12 says this, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. You grasp that? Can, can you get your mind around that this morning? That, that through our repentance and through our faith in Christ, through forgiveness, it's done. It's gone. There is no, there's nothing to be sorry for anymore it's over with he, he has forgiven us completely totally just as G- jesus death burial and resurrection completely satisfied god's wrath towards our sin god's forgiveness also is complete 100 percent complete when god buries the hatchet with us he doesn't leave the handle sticking out like we do right don't we do that quite often that we say we we forgive somebody but as soon as Maybe that person does something similar, the same thing again. You leave that hatchet sticking out because you want to pull it back out again and, and bring it up. Keep on bringing it up, throwing it up in people's faces about what they did. I know what you did, 
I thought you forgive me. I did forgive you, but you keep doing it. And so I can't forgive you if you keep doing it. It doesn't work that way with the Lord. That's not how God works. It doesn't operate like that. But there is a problem. If you continue to commit the same sin over and over again, you haven't repented. You haven't repented. That's the problem. The, the, the key to forgiveness is repentance. Jesus said this way in the Gospel of Mark. Mark 1.15, he said, And saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel. And then the Gospel of Luke in 5.32, it says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This is Jesus' words here. This is Jesus' words in the Gospels. And so what is repentance? What does it mean to repent? To repent means to turn away. It means to turn away. It's more than a retreat. It's turning around and going the opposite direction is what it means. It's far more than just saying you're sorry because I think that's sometimes that's what's communicated. It's, it's, just, it's, an, it's not enough to say you're sorry. And sorry is great. And asking for forgiveness is wonderful. But, but you stop doing what you're doing. Right? You don't just stop doing what you're doing. You turn and go the other way. You make a U-turn, right? a, a complete 180 and go the opposite direction. So we show that we're truly sorry when we stop committing the same sin that we say that we're sorry for. And Jesus taught it. He taught repentance throughout Scripture. A good example is the woman that was caught in the act of adultery. That's a, that's a great example of, of teaching repentance. If you remember uh, the, the story, she was, she was caught. She was caught red-handed, uh, just guilty without a doubt, no, no mistaking that what she had done and was uh, in the midst of. And the, remember, the religious mob had, had found this woman, and, and maybe there was some entrapment going on there. Whatever it was, it was used to try to trick Jesus. It was trying to set Jesus up as what they were doing. And so they brought this, this woman to him. They wanted to see what Jesus would say about the situation. So they wanted to make sure that he followed the law. And if he went against the law, then that would be one way they can you know, get rid of him or, or bring him up or make him look bad and, and, and get rid of him. But they, uh, all they wanted was this woman to be punished for her sin, to be stoned for adultery. That's what the law would say. But Jesus chose to extend grace. Instead, uh, Jesus chose to extend forgiveness. Let's look at it. Let's look at the passage together. Look at John uh, chapter 8, verses 2 through 11. It says, Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman called in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was called in adultery in the very act. Now Moses, in, uh, in the law, commanded us uh, such uh, should be stoned. But what do you say? They, this they said, testing him, that uh, they might have something to which to accuse him. But Jesus uh, stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it began uh, being convicted uh, by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman. Where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Did you, did you hear what he said? Did you hear what Jesus said that last little bit? Jesus had forgiven her completely, but he also told her to repent. Told her to repent. He was saying, I forgive you for, your, for being an adulterer. Now stop being an adulterer. Is what he is saying. That's what it is there. Because the, the, you, you say to go and sin no more. He's addressing that specific sin. Because the Bible over and over again says that we're, we're, we're not, we're not going to be sinless. Right? That we're still going to struggle with sin. He was addressing that. He was saying, stop being an adulterer. You were caught being an adulterer. Uh, I forgive you of this sin. Now stop. Stop being an adulterer. That's what he's saying. So for, he'd say the same thing for us. When we ask for forgiveness, it's repentance that he's looking for. Repentance is directly connected to our forgiveness. So how does God's forgiveness cover our sin? We just sang about it earlier this morning. The blood of Jesus. 
the blood of Jesus. That's how this happens, that, that Jesus was the perfect fulfillment of the Old Testament sacrificial system. In the Old Testament, man, they killed a lot of animals. And I don't think we quite get the understand the, the how how the temple worked and the and the Levites and the priests and the rest of the temple workers, man, that place ran with blood. You hear me? Th- those men were butchers and constantly shedding blood and killing animals to, to try to atone for the sin of the people. But but guess what? The blood of bull and goats wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to forgive sin. It wasn't enough to atone for sin. The 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 sacrificed animals in those days. Uh, we're just a foreshadowing of Jesus that would come, the perfect lamb. Hebrews 10, 1 and, uh, through 4 says, For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those w- w- who approach perfect. For, when, for then would they not have ceased to be offered. For the worshipers, once purified, would have no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. That was never the intention. That was never the point. This was a foreshadowing of the one that would come, the perfect sacrifice. That Jesus was was the one and only perfect sacrifice for our sin. Because only the sinless could be a covering for the sinful. And that's in, wherein lies that perfect is the, uh, Jesus is the perfect Lamb of God for us. And a little further on in Hebrews 10, verses 12 through 14, it says this about Jesus. It says, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, and from that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Right? The perfect land of God. Jesus, precious blood. Truly, just as that great old hymn says, what could wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God's forgiveness covers our sins. The second thing that we see from our, our, our two verses this morning is that God's forgiveness removes our guilt. God's forgiveness removes our guilt. And boy, do we need that. Do we need that? And uh, we live in a, in a, in a day that uh, if we talk about the legal system, most people will get upset, right? They, 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 they've had bad experiences and that nobody would argue that we have a flawed legal system. Now, I would say this, as far as I can tell, we, we, as flawed as it is, it's probably the, the better, best legal system that, on the planet, right? That, so it may be, have its issues, but believe me, it, it's, uh, uh, it's far better than anywhere else. Crafty lawyers uh, exploit loopholes and get the guilty off on technicalities. Uh, at, at times, the, sometimes the, the truly innocent are convicted because they're of uh, such great, compelling testimony of witnesses or, or these, uh, these, these gifted prosecuting attorneys, right, that can really manipulate and use words to, to paint a picture. But let me tell you what, as, in regards to God, all right, in God's economy, in God's courthouse, uh, God's justice uh, is, is without flaw. It's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. Nobody can fool God or persuade him of their innocence in regards to their sin. Nobody. There, there, there's no story. There's no way of getting around it. The Bible is his word, and he has already said that we're all guilty of sin. Right? Guilty. Guilty, guilty. Every one of us. We're all guilty, and we're all destined for an eternal torment in a place that's designed originally for Satan and his demons. A place the Bible calls hell. All right, that's, that, that's, that's where the guilty go. That's where the guilty belong because the wages of sin is death, according to Romans 6, 23. Now, when I was in seminary, I, I never had this experience when I was in, in grade school or high school. Uh, in seminary, taking some classes, some of the classes were more difficult than others, and, and one was a Christian doctrine class, and the professor was, he was, I love the class, first of all, let me say that, but his tests were hard. Very hard, and traditionally they were they were very very hard, and, and people scored relatively low on those. And so, as an act of grace for him, he he began to to grade on a curve. Anybody familiar with with that grading on a curve? Back in the back, you probably the curve buster back there. You probably mess things up for everybody else. What it is a curve is where uh, the the teacher, the professor, will make a decision to say uh, the the highest score. Uh, uh, from the students is going to set that that'll be the perfect score like if some, the highest score is a 90 then, then that'll be basically 100 and everybody else will have 10 points added 
to their score. Does that make sense? And so that's what that's what will happen. So I was like, well, that's pretty cool. That's, that's, that's decent. But it never failed that somebody in the class would ruin it for everybody else. Somebody, somebody would make a 96 or a 98, and therefore the rest of the, 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 the students <laughs> only got, got two points added to their grade. So if you made a, a 70, it got moved to a 72 or, or something along those lines. And so I thought it was wonderful. I said, man, well, that's pretty neat. That's a, a great extension of grace. But that works fine in seminary. That works fine in high school. But let me tell you, God don't grade on a curve. And if he did grade on a curve, guess what? Jesus busted the curve. <laughs> he busted the curve. He made a hundred. He made a perfect score, and so we don't have a shot. He's messed it up for all of us. His sinless life set the standard at perfection. And according to God, only sinless perfection is what's acceptable. Because some people would argue that, that, that they do a pretty good job at te- uh, keeping the Ten Commandments, right? They say, I'm, I'm pretty good at that. I can, you know, I can, if, if they can tell you what the Ten Commandments are, first of all. But they say they do a pretty good job. And, and look, maybe so. You know, maybe, maybe you know, don't, don't keep all of them perfectly. But see, the Bible says if you don't keep all of them perfectly, then basically you keep none of them perfectly. It's either it's all or nothing, right? If you don't keep them all, then you're, 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 you're guilty of all. It's all or nothing. It's either a pass or fail. It's perfect or imperfect because pretty well don't cut it. Almost don't cut it. Good enough, don't cut it. James 2.10 says, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. all right, so according to God's word, it's either we are either 100% innocent or we're 100% guilty. That's it. It's, it's, it's black or white. It's no, it's no in between. There's no middle ground. Almost perfect is not the same as perfect, right? It's not the same as perfect. And so for us, by repenting of our sin and confessing Jesus as our Lord and Savior, our guilt is removed. Our guilt is removed that Jesus takes our guilt and gives us his righteousness in return. Tell about an exchange, the great exchange, the unimaginable that he would do this for us. Now, to be clear... God did not just overlook our sin and give us a free pass. That's not what has happened. Don't think of it that way. Don't think of that, all right, God, I repent, I believe, forgive me, and now this sin just poof, just disappears. Right? That, that sin just goes away, it just magically disappears. That's not the case at all. That's not the case at all. That, that would make him unjust. All sin must be punished. It had to be punished. Our sin was punished. Our guilt and punishment was placed on Jesus on the cross. That's what happened to the sin. The, the penalty for our sin was fully paid for by Jesus on the cross. Because Jesus took our place under God's wrath. That's where we were. That's what belonged to us. He got what we deserved. First Peter uh, 1, 18 and 19 says this. It says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. It all comes back to the precious blood of Jesus. Right? Everything turns back to him. Because of the blood of Jesus, God no longer sees us as guilty, but as his adopted sons and daughters. Wow. As perfect. He sees us as sinless. He sees us as holy. Because we have Christ's righteousness now imputed to us, given to us, taking away our guilt, taking away our shame, taking away our sin. This is accomplished through repentance. Repentance and faith in Jesus, we can be forgiven. God's forgiveness removes the guilt of our sin. So this morning, as we close out our time together, where are you? Where are you at? Are you forgiven? Have you received the forgiveness of God? Because God's forgiveness is available this morning to everyone in this room and to whoever will be listening to this sermon later online. God's forgiveness is available. But there is a catch. There is a a small catch. God's forgiveness can only be received. It can't be earned. It's a gift. It's a gift of God. In John 3, 16 and 17, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And look at 17. 
This one gets left out a lot. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's what this is about. That's what forgiveness is about. So I would plead with you this morning to be saved today, to be forgiven today. Leave this place changed, saved, transformed. Have your sin covered and your guilt removed today. Because Jesus dealt with your sin 2,000 years ago on the cross. You say, well, Brother Mike, how do I do that? How, how can I be saved? How can I be forgiven? Uh, the Bible talks about how we, we confess our sin. That we do it through prayer. Right there where you're at in your seat in a few moments. Even now, that, that, as we close our time with the invitation, just bow your head simply and, and, and tell God what He already knows. Confess to Him that you're a sinner. You're, you're a sinner and, 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 that, and that you want to repent of your sin and that you want to accept the, the, the work that Jesus did on the cross. You want to accept Him as your Lord and Savior. And then from that time forward, your, your life will be given to Him. You will become His bondservant, a slave to Christ, and that you will follow Him to the best of your ability and, the, and that the Holy Spirit would lead you to do this. That's what salvation means. Moving from, moving from just understanding Jesus in your head to, to having Jesus in your heart. That's what salvation, salvation means. So in our time, in just a moment as we close, consider that. I, I, I would plead with you to be saved today. And for my brothers and sisters in Christ this morning, there's more to forgiveness for us as well. It's not just about being saved. It's about restoring relationships with God. But it's also, uh, we have horizontal relationships to be taken care of as well. And, and some of us in this room may need to have some, some business we need to do with one another. Right, forgiveness with one another. This will be a great time as we close out our time invitation. There may be somebody in this room that you need to go and, and, and say, look, brother, look, sister, I, I need to confess something to you. There's, there's something I need to ask you to forgive me about. That would be a great time to do that this afternoon as well. Or maybe when you leave this place, you need to get on the phone and call somebody or, or email somebody or go to somebody's house and, and, and say, look, I, I've, I've sinned against you. There's something I've been doing, I, something I've done. Maybe you don't know about it, or maybe you do, and it's, it's a burden on my heart, and God's convicted me today of my sin, and I need to ask you to forgive me. And, and so I would plead with you to do that today. So whatever it is that, that the Lord is leading you to do this morning, is it to be saved, to accept Christ for the first time? Do that. If you have sin that you need to confess uh, just between you and the Lord to, to, to get it off your chest, do that. If you have sin or, or an issue between you and some, a brother or sister in this place, do that before you leave this place. Whatever it is the Lord is leading you to do, Let's do that before we leave this place. Let's, let's, uh, let me pray, and we'll have a moment of response. Father, thank you for this day, God. Thank you for your grace. Father, we thank you for the, uh, the, the gift of salvation, the gift of grace. Father, we deserve hell. We see it. We see it in your word. We, we see it. Uh, it haunts us, God. Father, we know that we're, we're uh, sinners and that we, we understand that we have uh, uh, broken your law. We deserve uh, to be separated from you, God, but, but you loved us too much. You love us too much uh, to, to let it end that way, Father. You, you gave your one and only Son. You sent Jesus uh, to take on uh, the punishment for our sin, that, that, that he satisfied your wrath against us. And, Father, your word just says it plainly that whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved, that, that if we repent and believe that we will be saved over and over again, Father. So, Lord, I, I pray that in this closing time, Father, that, that you would move amongst this group of people, Father. Lord, that, that some would be moved to salvation, Lord. Father, I pray for those as well that are here this morning that have been carrying around uh, guilt and shame father there's something on their heart father that that they need to, to 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 be cleared of father that they need to ask for forgiveness from from you father they need to ask forgiveness from uh, the one that they've offended lord thank you so much god for your grace thank you for this moment thank you for this time that we, we can ask for forgiveness father give the ones encouragement father uh, give them the boldness to to do what 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 you would have them to do this morning we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.